In world history, there have been many people whose lives still raise many questions, and not all the secrets of these people are destined to be solved. But before I get to the video, I want to recommend you my new channel, Vision of Crime, where I tell about interesting and criminal stories and mysterious disappearances, shocking crimes in the USA and Europe. I am sure you will not be bored. Follow the link that appeared in the upper right corner. Also, the link to the channel I have placed in the description to this video. So, let's continue. The Iron Mask One of the most mysterious people in world history is considered to be the Iron Mask, the mysterious prisoner number 644-89001. Until now, no one knows who this mysterious man was. There is little reliable information about his past. The prisoner was born in the 1940s of the 17th century. The first mention of him in the prison archives appears in 1669. The minister of war Marquis de Louvois wrote to the prison about the arrival of a prisoner from whom a black velvet mask was never removed. And the prisoner was forbidden, on pain of death, to remove the mask or speak to anyone about his past. In prison, he was arranged as well as possible. He was not refused anything, whatever he asked for. The famous writer Voltaire was greatly intrigued by the identity of the mask. Here is what he wrote. First of all, one must reflect on the fact that no significant person disappeared at this time. At the same time, it is clear that the prisoner was a person of exceptional importance and that everything connected with him was always kept secret. Voltaire cites the testimony of people who tried to find out from the most prominent officials of the time who the mysterious prisoner was. But all those who could reveal the secret of the mask flatly refused to speak, citing the fact that they had taken an oath. They only said it was a state secret. The prisoner was transported from prison to prison until he died 34 years later in the Bastille. After Iron Mask's death in 1703, the room in which he lived was thoroughly searched. The walls were scraped out and re-whitewashed. Furniture was burned, gold and silver utensils melted down. The authorities feared that the prisoner might have left some clue about the reason for his imprisonment. Who was the mysterious prisoner? Some believe that Louis XIV's twin brother was hiding under the mask. Allegedly after his birth, he was isolated and hidden all his life to avoid disputes over the throne. Another version says that the prisoner was Louis XIV's real father because at the time of his birth Louis XIII had supposedly been out of touch with his wife for many years and Louis XIV's real father first fled abroad but was subsequently captured and imprisoned for the rest of his life. And perhaps the most original version is that under the mask hid none other than the real Peter the Great who at that time was just traveling through Europe and supposedly Peter was imprisoned and an imposter went to Russia instead of him. But today, unfortunately, none of these versions cannot be verified. And with a high probability, the mystery of the identity of the mask will remain unsolved. But not only France is famous for its mysterious prisoner. Prisoner of Kexholm. In 1803, Emperor Alexander I traveled through the western lands and visited the fortress of Kexholm. The Decemberists and the Pugachev family were once held in this famous prison. The emperor wished to visit the prisoners of the fortress and graciously listened to each of them. Afterwards, Alexander asked if he listened to all the prisoners. And the commandant of the fortress answered that he had one more, a nameless prisoner. The mysterious man who lived behind a bricked up door in one of the cellars of the fortress for more than 30 years on one bread and water. Upon learning of this, the emperor and his retinue went to the prisoner. Barely opening the rusted door, the commandant brought out a decrepit, half-blind old man. The sight of the prisoner was ghastly, with his clothes in tatters, his hair in a tangle, and his whole body covered with a crust of mud. The prisoner was washed and cut, and the intrigued emperor asked him to tell his story. The old man agreed to talk to the emperor, but only in private. The emperor agreed, asked all the witnesses to come out, and left alone with the prisoner to listen to his story. An hour later, Alexander came out of the nameless man with tears in his eyes, and to the surprise of those around him, ordered that the unfortunate man be released and gave him a spare set of clothes. The old man was given a pension, but was forbidden to leave the vicinity of the fortress. 
He lived another 15 years in the wooden house of the surrounding village and, finally going blind, died a quiet death. And now the most interesting thing, until now no one knows who this prisoner was. The emperor told no one the old man's secret, and the old man himself flatly refused to speak to anyone about his past until his death. The archives of the fortress could find no record of who the prisoner was and why he was imprisoned for 30 years. According to witnesses, the prisoner was brought to the fortress on the personal order of Catherine II. An aristocratic young man in an overcoat, cap and shirt was driven to Kexholm by a carriage with washed out horses. He was imprisoned, the door was sealed, and no one was allowed to communicate with him. A small window, through which the prisoner was given food for 30 years, was his only contact with the outside world. It is known that upon ascending the throne, Emperor Paul I familiarized himself with the case of the unfortunate prisoner, but did not release him. Many historians consider this fact as direct evidence that the nameless prisoner posed a truly serious threat to the royal family. There are several versions of who the mysterious prisoner was. According to one of them, he was a certain Ivan Pakarin, who claimed to be the illegitimate son of Catherine the Great. It is believed that outwardly he was very similar to the Empress, supposedly so sincerely believed that she was his mother that people willy-nilly began to believe this legend. He was considered a danger to the autocracy, and for this he was exiled to eternal imprisonment. But isn't that too strange a punishment and conditions of detention for a mere imposter? According to another version, the prisoner was the juvenile Emperor John VI, dethroned by Elizaveta Petrovna. Allegedly, on the very first day of his reign, Catherine II issued a decree transferring Iowan from the fortress of Schlüsselburg, where he was at the time, to the fortress of Kexholm. To destroy the memory of the heir, they staged a murder. And Yoan was taken far away from the capital and walled up in a dungeon. But anyway, today one cannot say with any certainty who the prisoner of Kexholm was done. Kasper Hauser the following man may not seem so mysterious at first glance, but a series of extremely strange circumstances that accompanied his life make many still seek to unravel the mystery of Caspar Hauser's past. On May 26, 1828, a young man of about 16 appeared in a street in Nuremberg. He looked dazed and could hardly walk. He was carrying two letters, allegedly from his mother and his guardian. The mother complained that she was too poor to raise the child, and the guardian asked that he be enrolled in the cavalry regiment where his father was serving. Passersby noticed the young man, but he only repeated a misleading phrase, I want to be a cavalryman like my father. At first they took him for a madman, but people soon realized that it was not that simple. The young man acted as if he were in human society for the first time. When he was given paper and a pen, he suddenly wrote, in crooked letters, Caspar Hauser. Probably he had long been taught to write only that name, by which he became known. Caspar's mystery stirred up the community. All the local newspapers wrote about him, and at some point Caspar became a real celebrity. Many specialists tried to find out where he came from. Because of his meager vocabulary, Caspar could tell very little about his past. He lived in a cramped room from which he could not leave. An unknown invigilator brought him food and cleaned the room. Then the invigilator began to teach him how to write Caspar Hauser and made him learn a phrase about his cavalryman father. Once he took Caspar with him, they walked for several days until they were in town, where he was alone. After hearing about the story from the newspapers, Germany's most famous criminologist, Feuerbach, decided to start his own private investigation. And then a chain of very strange events began. Hauser moved in with his new guardian, where he met the British Lord Stanhope. This strange man suddenly arrived in Germany and assured him that he wanted to adopt Caspar, take him with him, and educate him. Stanhope assured Hauser that he came from a noble family and was born with great power. Stanhope moved Hauser to his German home under the pretext of security and left for Britain, leaving Caspar with a certain schoolmaster, Meyer. He was a very strange and suspicious man who was remembered to have treated Hauser with almost disgust. In May of 33, the criminalist Feuerbach died suddenly of a strange illness. There were rumors that he had been poisoned, for he was young and full of energy. It was at that moment, 
in the wake of Farbach's investigation that information emerged that Hauser was indeed of noble blood. And this is what happened next. Six months after Farbach's death, Hauser was walking in the park where an unknown man approached him and, after clarifying his identity, offered to go to a secluded place to tell the secret of his birth. After stepping away from public view, the stranger stabbed Hauser and fled. Hauser was able to make it home, but Marr did nothing. When word spread around town that Hauser had been stabbed, Meyer began to assert that Casper had stabbed himself to get attention. However, Hauser was getting worse and worse, the wound was very severe, and help was too late. Hauser had time to describe the perpetrator, but because of Meyer, time was lost and Casper died a few days later. The results of Farbach's study were not published for several more decades so as not to cause a scandal. According to his version, Casper was the son of Carl Ludwig, Grand Duke of Baden. The nuance is that Casper's grandfather had children from a second marriage who could not claim the throne if Casper or his brothers were alive. So, in 1812, Carl Ludwig had a son who was the same age as Hauser, but he soon died under strange circumstances. His mother was simply not allowed into the child's bedroom and was only told that the child had died. For years later the second son also died, and in 1818, at the age of only 32, Carl Ludwig himself died, and the throne passed to the descendants of the second marriage. According to some researchers, the first child did not die. He was hidden from his mother and moved to a small room in one of the castles where he spent his childhood. At some point, apparently deeming him weak-minded and non-threatening, Casper was taken outside, but when a fuss was made about his name, Hauser was killed. And Stanhope may have been a confidant of those who ordered the murder done. And already in the 20th century, a secret room was found in a castle near Nuremberg, inside which a wooden horse was found. Hauser said that the wooden horse was his only toy, and DNA analysis of a strand of his hair confirmed a 95% similarity to the DNA of Ludwig's descendants. However, the final point in this case has not yet been made, and enthusiasts are waiting for further research. If you liked the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and write what you think about it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Your support is very important to me.